Well, the table has been set well this morning for us to look into God's Word. So uh, let's get our Bibles out and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Today we're going to be uh, looking at a bit of a different style of a message and uh, a little bit more topical on a topic that the elders have asked me to uh, speak to the church about. And uh, I'm looking forward to it, a great challenge in my own life, and a challenge I trust in yours as well. And uh, so we'll dive into that this morning, thankful for God's word that it is faithful. You know, one of the things I really love watching is babies as they develop. You bring this baby home and you swaddle it and you, like a little I don't know what, put it in the crib, it can't roll over, can't do anything. It is 100% dependent on mom primarily, but on the parents to take care of it. And then, and then you watch the parents as this a little, little bundle uh, learns to roll over, and the parents think they've now raised a, a, a rocket scientist because their kid rolled over way earlier than anybody else's kid ever did in history. And, uh, and then they start to wiggle around and start to move, and, and then they start to crawl. And um, in our small group, uh, we have a little baby. Her name is Ginny, and Ginny is crawling. And it's so funny, now she gets up on her knees, and when we worship in our small groups, she starts to boogie along with us, and it's just so fun to watch her move, and, and now she pulls herself up, and she stands, and uh, is, is learning that she can let go, hasn't quite figured out yet to put one foot in front of the other, but eventually she will, and then there's no stopping her after that, right? I just, I love watching that process happen. I loved watching it with our own kids. I, I remember our own kids learning to walk and their first steps and all of the rest of it is, is part of the journey of growing up and, and becoming a person who is developing. And, uh, and we see that. Um, the reality with our kids is as they grow up and as they move from can't roll over to walking, they also move from dependence to independence. And all of a sudden, it's like, well, we can make our way around and get into things we could never get into before. And, and that just goes on uh, for the rest of our lives. Um, but they learn how to walk. They learn how to put one foot in front of the other. They learn how to become, is that where, is it where, to be more mature as they develop. And that's what we want to talk about today in the message. The elders have asked me to preach a message specifically talking about the spiritual disciplines in the believer's life. The spiritual disciplines in a believer's life. And uh, we're going to do that from Ephesians, specifically uh, the jump off first will be Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 13. But it's important that you have a little bit of context about even this text. Um, Ephesians is an awesome book to study. It's an amazing book to read devotionally. The first three chapters are just chucked full of theology. And so as we're learning to walk as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to have our theology right. In Ephesians 1, 7, it says, in him we have redemption. Our hope is in him. Through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespass according to the riches of his grace. In Ephesians chapter 2, 4 to 6, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love which, uh, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespass, and he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up with him and seat, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Those are awesome truths. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. It's a gift of God. It's not as a result of work so that no one can boast and then you go over to chapter 3 and verse 20. And now to him. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power of the work within us. To him, to Jesus Christ, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. And the whole first three chapters of Ephesians are like drinking from the fire hose of theology. And they're important. Paul puts them first because if you don't get that right, you're not going to get the second part right. But in chapter 4 and verse 1, he says, 
I therefore, as a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And now he moves to the practical. What does this living for Jesus, what does it look like? And as we've talked at the elders, we've, we, we were just talking about, you know, sometimes we tell people, you, just, you need to open your Bible, or you need to do this, or you need to do that. And, and people may not be discipled. What does that even mean? What does it mean that I'm supposed to walk in Christ? What would that look like in my life? And in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, that's our verse here for today. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand firm. I read this uh, little joke the, uh, the other day. It said, I got on my bathroom scale this morning, and let me tell you, the full armor of God is heavy. <laughs> That's my excuse forever, right? Um, what does it mean to stand. Now, what does it mean to, to walk in Christ? And why is that even important? Um, it's important because the days are evil. It's important because the world we live in is not in love with who we are and who we trust in the Savior and Jesus Christ. So it's important that we stand. I love how that verse goes, and I've changed the emphasis just slightly in it in verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand. Did you stand this past week? Was Jesus Christ so the focus of your life that he became the priority in the things that you did? Or did other things get in the way and we all struggle with those and I struggle with those, but, but what, what, what place did he take? After you've done everything to stand there for, stand. Stand. The main thought for me today as we look at this text, as I, or at this message was, I stand because I desire to be more like Jesus each day. Growing in godliness. We want to talk today about spiritual disciplines, things you should be, can be, need to be growing in as a follower of Jesus Christ. Not to earn the favor of God, but because of his favor on your life. What we're going to talk about is not how you get to God. It's not how you come to the Lord Jesus. It's not about that specifically. It's about as a result of how awesome God is, as a result of chapters 1 to 3 of Ephesians, why then do I want to live my life out for the glory of my Savior, Jesus Christ, and then help us, help us, how do we do that? How do we do that? Uh, three things we want to look at today. People who are in Christ, here's the first one, stand. The pictures of spiritual discipline in Scripture. See, it's not just one picture. There's lots of pictures, lots of ways we can see. You've already heard me uh, talk about a, the a couple of them already. The, the first one is the picture of the spiritual walk. In Ephesians 5, uh, 15 to 17, it says, Look carefully then how you walk not as, uh, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Because the days are evil. There's uh, to be no, f excuse me, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Uh, Romans 8 verse 4 says, For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. And so as you take a look at this topic of spiritual disciplines, you could put it under the topic of, of walking, walking in Christ. 
Uh, you could take a look at it in the picture of running the race. It's another picture. Uh, I don't believe that they're synonymous. I just believe that they're parallels. Um, run the race, Philippians 3. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Child of God, we need to learn how to walk. We need to learn how to run the race. We need to learn how to take on the fruit of the Spirit, another picture. But the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Another picture of this idea of spiritual disciplines would be growing up or maturing. In Colossians 1, it says, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Another picture of this spiritual disciplines would be to put things off and to put things on. In Colossians 3, 12 to 17, it says, put on then as God's chosen one, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms with thankfulness in your heart to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Another picture of this, of this walking or spiritual disciplines would be dead to sin but alive to Christ. Uh, so you must also consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus, Romans 6. Another picture of it would be to be imitators, imitators of the Lord in, in Ephesians 5 as Paul has now made the shift from theology to the practical. In Ephesians 5, 1, he says, therefore imitate, be imitators of God. As beloved children. Literally, that word imitators means to mimic. To mimic. You ever mimic somebody? Do you ever? I've, I've told this story before a long time ago. But I remember my brother, uh, my brother who's two years older than me, would always be getting in trouble, unlike myself. But he would always be getting in trouble. And, and my mom would, you know, lecture 22B as to why you should be obedient. And, why, and I used to love to mimic my mother when she was disciplining my brother. And she'd be like, da, 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 and I'd be behind her just doing what she was doing. I knew he was going to beat me up when it was all over, but somehow it made sense at the time. I was just mimicking. We're supposed to do that with Jesus. The things that you've heard and seen. Just do those things. Just do those things. He's learned to mimic. Um, another picture would be right thinking. Finally, brothers, whatever's true and honorable and just, whatever is pure and lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Then another picture of this, um, of this whole idea of spiritual disciplines would be walking by faith and not by sight. In Hebrews 11, we have the great hall of faith of these people who live not perfect lives, but lives with the eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. People who are in Christ stand Stand. And there's lots of ways that we see that in Scripture. But the second thing I want us to look at, people who are in Christ stand, face hindrances to standing. And this may be where you are today, and there's a reason why your, your spiritual life really hasn't changed much in the last year or so. And I, I wrote down four uh, or five different reasons why you don't stand. Here's the first one, and I don't want to set it aside easily. You don't stand because you don't know Jesus. You can't truly stand if you don't know Jesus. And that's the purpose of the gospel. It's the purpose of the good news, that we would trust the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you don't have Christ in you, the hope of glory, you can't possibly stand for him. You can't. 
And so that's one of the hindrances to standing. And we're going to come back to the gospel as one of the things we look at. But, but you need to search your heart and go, am I in Christ? Not, not a head knowledge, not a, I know about Christ, I know what he did for me, but a, but a heart knowledge. It's moved and I believe this, this is true, and it's true for me. Because you can't stand and you won't stand if the gospel is not real in your life. But here's another one. The guilt of failure. The guilt of failure from sin. Um, and you have sin in your heart. You have sin in your life. And your spiritual life is just a wishy-washy mess because there's unconfessed and unrepentant sin in your life. You won't stand. You won't stand. Um, and maybe it's the, uh, the, the guilt or failure from comparison. I look around me. You know, maybe you hear a message, the title of a message, the topic of a message that says a spiritual disciplines in your life. And you go, yeah, but I'm so far behind. I claim to know Christ since I was eight years old, and yet I haven't. I'm so far behind. Um, that's an excuse. The Lord doesn't accept that excuse because today's a new day and today's a new beginning, and there's an opportunity for you to move forward. But, but maybe that's your comparison. I'm so far behind everybody else. Maybe there's the, uh, the guilt or failure from fear because of the cost. If, if I truly, truly take on the disciplines of Christ, it's going to cost me. It's going to cost me. And the answer to that is, yes, it is. It's going to cost you. But remember what it cost the one who made it even possible for you in the first place. It's going to cost. Or maybe there's this. Maybe the reason you don't stand is because you don't know how to stand. You don't know how to stand. There's a lack of discipleship in your life. It was a number of years ago. There might have even still been pews in the room, but there was a couple who came to church who sat right in the second row, right there. And, and I preached a message, and they came up after the service. It was their first time here. And uh, she did most of the talking. He was pretty quiet. And, and it was obvious to me that she was with child. She was pregnant. She was going to have a baby. Craziest thing a man can ever do is ask a woman if she's pregnant, right? Like, that's just going nowhere good sometimes. And so, but she came up, and there she was, and standing in the front, and she told me that they had just come to Christ, and, and um, not that many months earlier, and, uh, and I can tell she's pregnant. And I said, uh, so is this your husband? And she goes, no, he's my boyfriend. And my mind goes to all kinds of things that we're going to have to do, how we're going to have to fix this situation and all the rest of it. And it's like she knew Jesus. She didn't know that you're supposed to wait until you get married, until you get pregnant. She didn't know. There was a lack of discipline. She had never been discipled in her life. It was great to watch them. They moved. They went up to Newmarket after a little while. But it, it was great to watch and see them grow up in Christ. And they got married. And, and God was working in their lives. And, but maybe you're here today and you're like, I just, I just don't even know where to begin. I don't know what to do. I, I want to grow up in Christ. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know what to do. And so that's what the remainder of this message is going to be about today. We're, we're going to talk about seven ways people who are in Christ Stand. Seven ways. I don't want you to think I got to get all seven of these fixed today. I just want you to take a look at what God's word says, and hopefully I can give you some tools in the process to get you going. Um, but seven different things. There's seven things that are core things. There's more than seven. I, I talked about all these different ways that this is this pictured and all the rest. Uh, they, there's discussion. Are there 14 different spiritual disciplines? Are there how many... Let's start somewhere. Today I want to start with seven things that would help you in your ability to stand. So here's the first one. We learn to stand. We learn to grow in our spiritual disciplines when we stand on the word of God. When we stand on the word of God. Psalm 119.11 says, I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 says, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable. 
profitable for teaching, profitable for reproof, profitable for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Follower of Christ. If you had to go looking for your Bible this morning because you brought it home after church last Sunday and put it somewhere and haven't opened it since then and had to go find it, this point's for you. We need to be people who are of the book. We need to be people who open God's word and read it. I had uh, two guys in my youth group way back a long time ago when we were living in Ajax, and, and uh, these two guys would always be at youth. They'd always be on time. They always had their Bible. They always, I go, man, these guys are so good. And then I'd watch them, and I, I noticed one where they go out, and they put their Bible on the shelf at the church as they're leaving, and they pick it up when they come back the next week. Okay, they missed the point, right? Your word have I hid in my heart. Your word is a lamp to my feet. God's word is profitable. God's word is what gives us direction. It doesn't return void in our lives. And we need to be people of God who read it who read it. I've got a little reading plan in the front of my Bible. I'm a bit of a keener about these things and get going. And this year is read through the whole Bible. Last year was read through the New Testament Psalms and Proverbs. But this year, it's the whole Bible. And I don't work on the weeks because I get crazy about that. I'm, for, I'm ahead, which was good. I never was ahead in school. So reading the Bible, that's good. So I, just, I like to read it. And, and sometimes I just read it. Sometimes I put it on my iPhone and I listen and read it as I go. Sometimes I just listen, but you need to be bathing yourself in the word of God. If you're not reading it, you're not growing in Christ. And so you need to read it. You need to memorize it. You need to have a verse, maybe a verse each month that, that you memorize, that you take, and you go, that's my verse for this month. That's a, I don't want to make this a legalistic thing. I'm just telling you, if you're not hiding God's word in your heart, you're not, you're not growing in Christ. And lots of Christians get their food for the week, and then they go home, and that's as far as it really goes. And we need to be people who are in the book every day. Well, I don't know how to do that. Well, just read it. Just open it. Just read it. I got an idea. Share what you're learning. Share what you're learning. I've tried to do that the last uh, couple of weeks. I talked about what I learned from the life of David, right? And the life, choose to sin, choose to suffer, and the reality that he was a man after God's own heart. Just what are coming out of my reading. In our small group coming out of that, we're talking, going around, sharing what we learned in, in reading the word of God. And, and I was reading about Naaman. If you remember Naaman, he was the guy who um, goes, he has leprosy, and he's told to go and, and, and dunk seven times into the in the river, and he'll be healed, and all that. That's the story. But the nugget for me was the little servant girl who told Naaman, Naaman's wife, to, you, you go and speak to the prophet in Israel. And here's this girl who was stolen from her home and put into uh, this, this family where she didn't want to be. She could have said nothing, but she knew her Lord, and she wanted to see Naaman healed. I thought, man, would I be like that? Would I have had that heart to serve? See, those are the things that I'm learning. What, what are you learning? Could you do that if somebody came up to you after the service and said, what did you learn in God's word last week? What did you learn in God's word? Do you have a nugget? It's not rocket science. It's just read God's word. We need to open it. It's powerful. We need to be in God's word regularly, devotions daily. Here's one. We have a group in things in our church called Three Chord where, where people are reading God's word together and are accountable to each other and ask each other questions. And what a great idea. It's God's word. You ask, well, where do I start? If you've never read the Bible before, start in the book we're studying in our, in our series. Start in the Gospel of John and just answer the questions about who is Jesus and what did he do and why did he do it and just read it. Get somebody to read it with you and talk about it. If you're more seasoned in your faith, get into the book of Ephesians and just study to see all the things God's done for you. And then, oh my goodness, now as a result of that, what will, how will I live out for him and his glory?
One of the very first disciplines in the believer's life is that we stand on the word. Here's the next one, that we stand in prayer. We stand in prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. Don't stop praying. Why? Why is that important? Because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. People are running around going, what's the will of God? What's the will of God? Well, the will of God is your sanctification. We'll see that later on. The, the will, this is the will of God, that you would pray without ceasing, that you'd be a person of prayer. Philippians 4 says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Finally, brother, whatever is true and honorable and just and pure, think about these things. Think about these things. Prayer is how we get to know our Father. Uh, when you're reading the word and when you're in prayer so that you can know the will of God. So we've had a, I've had a thing on, on our, our lives praying about a couple of them. One is the salvation of our grandkids. Pray for them every day. But more recently, um, as you, many of you know, our daughter was moving from Muskoka to uh, New Brunswick. They're now there. They're getting settled. And we're thankful to God for that. And we were praying about that. And, and it seemed like, man, we were praying and God was answering prayer. And we were praying and God was answering prayer. Pray that they would sell their place. Pray that the situation, the move would happen. They would get there safely. Pray. And it was like, bam, 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 bam. And God's doing all those things. And it was awesome. But there was another part of the prayer. Lord, help us. I don't want them to go to New Brunswick. I want them to stay in Ontario. Help me, Lord. Help my unbelief. Help my doubting. See, it's easy to paint the picture of how you just like, boom, and it's always there, and it's always easy, and it's always... My wife has shed tears. I have shed tears over them going to New Brunswick. Don't want them to go. But you do, Lord. So help me to come in line with what you want. Help me to follow after what you want for them in their lives. I don't know how I would have got through that without being able to come to God knowing he is faithful and coming to him in prayer to know the will of God. Not to get what you want, but to get what he wants. Where your will and his will come into alignment with each other. We pray and in prayer we are see our sin revealed. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. Well, how do you pray? Um, we use the Acts acrostic a lot around here. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Take time and think about God to adore him. We're going to come back to that under worship. Come and think about confession. Come before him, search me, oh God. I had to, even in my daughter's move, come to, is this becoming a thing in my life? Am, am I becoming covetous in this? Is this what I want more than I want what you want, God? Is that confession? Choosing to be filled with thanksgiving in all circumstances. My God, so supply all your need. All your need. We need to be people of God any time, every time, all the time. Um, we come to church on Sunday morning, and if I would stop singing crazy songs or whatever, then Sue can pray for us as we're driving down McCowan. But, but we just, we pray. We pray while we're traveling. Um, I love praying for people as I'm driving along going, oh, they live near there, or they live near there, and, and to pray for them, and it's not something you just do in the morning. It's prayer needs to be a part of our lives. Calling out to God with thanksgiving and giving him the glory, but praying also. Um, you have a high priest in heaven, Jesus Christ, who can identify with every kind of thing you're going through. And he's in heaven interceding on your behalf. We need to be people who are about prayer. Well, well I don't know. I don't know the words to use. I don't know how to. You just talk to God. Father, I'm thankful for who you are. I'm thankful for what you've done. And, and Lord, I've got some things on my mind right now. Don't worry about churches. Don't worry about church words. Just come to the Lord. We have a promise that the fervent prayer of righteous people accomplishes much Ephesians 5 talks about that. 
It's the thing as a church we're really wrestling towards that, that we would be a church more, more committed to be being bathed what we do in prayer. I love the fact that there's a group that meets during the services who prays for the services. I love the fact that uh, a group of leaders and staff meet out right in that room at 8.15 and pray for the service. And then we come over here and the worship team prays before the service. We need to be people of God who are just bathing in prayer everything. Not, but not just in the corporate sense, but in our lives. Stand in prayer. But I'm just not sure. Just start. Just pray in Jesus' name. Lord, help me. Help me, Lord. Next thing we need to stand in obedience. If we're going to stand, we need to be obedient. Um, so here's the question I would have for every one of us, self included. What is there in your life right now that in God's word you know that you need to do? that you haven't done or aren't doing, then that's the reason you came to church this morning, that you would be obedient. Obedient to what God has called you to do. 1 Samuel 15 says, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. 1 John 2, 3, and 4 says, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but doesn't keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. <coughs> Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, the verse after for by grace are you saved through faith. Says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do. To do. To do the commands of God. To be faithful to what you know God's word says. Whether that's in, a, in your marriage, whether that's to authorities, whether that's in a picture of, of, of friendships. What, what's God telling me? What, as you're here this morning, what is God saying to you? I need to do this in the area of obedience. If you're going to have the spiritual discipline, you need to do it. Not because I said it, but because of who Jesus is and what he's accomplished in your life. I love the number of baptisms we've had in our church. Have you ever been baptized as a follower of Jesus Christ? Have you ever been baptized? If you haven't, why not? They that gladly received his word were baptized. It's the way we identify. It's, just, it's, a, it's an illustration. But maybe that's why you're here at church this morning. So I, need to, I need to do this. I've been reluctant to do it. I've been resistant to do it. I have been, I've got all the reasons I don't want to do it. And the Lord's saying, it's time. Time to do it. Here's another one. Stand in purity. Stand in purity. Psalm 139, 23 and 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. 1 John 1 says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, feel a long way off this morning. You feel like I, I just, I read my Bible, it just seems to be empty. I, I try to pray, but it doesn't seem to go any. Well, maybe this verse is for you. Psalm 66, 18, if I have cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Maybe, maybe the reason God feels a long way off today is because you moved. And you need to come before him. You need to be a person of integrity and of character. Um, you ever heard the illustration of somebody says, well, if that's what a Christian's like, then I don't want to be one? I remember somebody saying that way back, and I thought, well, we're not perfect. We're not perfect. No, but we're forgiven, and we're people who confess our sin to one another, and we're people who, God, help me to live in such a way that people don't point the finger at me. 
You say, if that's what a Christian's like, I don't want to be one. Stand with your church. Three more. Stand with your church. You realize the church is God's idea. It's not our idea. And so if you want to be a, an obedient follower of Christ, if you want to be a person who is growing in your spiritual disciplines, you need to stand with the church where Christ is the head. Ephesians 5 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to everything, um, in everything to their husbands. Christ is the head of this church. I mentioned last week that he is the good shepherds. The elders are the under shepherds who are going to give an account. But the chief shepherd of the church is Jesus Christ. And so what we're doing here, coming together like this, is God's idea. And so if you want to be an obedient follower of Christ, if you want to be a person in the disciplines of Christ, that you make this a significant priority. Doing life together. Doing life together in fellowship. Uh, we had a great time in our small group. There were four guys there on Thursday night and uh, just praying for each other and praying for different things and what's God teaching us. And I need that. I love that on Monday when we get together with the elders and we pray and we do life together. I love it when someone's hurting or struggling and we come alongside and we do life together together. I love it when we can spur one another on to love and good deeds. Why? Because we're doing life together. This thing called the church is God's idea. It needs to be a high priority in our lives, and we need to be people of God who serve in the church. All the parts are necessary, Romans says. You're not unnecessary. Well, no, the church won't miss me. No, the Lord has a place for you in his church to serve in his church. And if you want to be growing up in Christ, maybe the spiritual discipline you need to hear about today is serving in the church. Serving in the church. I'm going to find my place. I'm going to serve. You're like, oh, I don't know what to do. Well, try something. If that's not what it is, try something else. But I'm, I'm going to serve in the church of Jesus Christ. Sue's dad, who was a, a giant, spiritual giant for me, he used to say this. He used to say, I'm saved for service. I'm saved for service. That's why the Lord saved me, so I could serve. There's lots of other reasons, but I'm saved to serve. Because why? Because we're part of the church, this church that's God's idea. It helps us to meet the needs of the community. It's where we stand together in prayer for leadership. So we learn to love each other, even when it's a little bit ugly. Even when we, we might not be or someone else might not be that ugly, we have this family called the church and we're in this thing together. Why? Because it's God's idea. It's God's idea. And so church needs to be right up there on the top things of your priority every single week. It should help you to make decisions about what your kids do or don't do, what you do or don't do. I'm not saying don't go on vacation. I'm not saying anything like that. I'm just saying, is the church of Jesus Christ, where is it on your list of, this is what's important in my life? It was important enough that Jesus died for it. Prioritize church. It's his idea. It's his plan. Here's another one. Stand in the gospel. Stand in the gospel. What motivates us? The finished work of Jesus Christ should be the primary motivator. God's grace poured out on his glory, shone down in Jesus Christ. His coming, his suffering, his, and your trusting Christ as your Savior. That should put wind in your sails. That should put gas in your tank. For this is why I love my Savior. This is why I want to serve him. By remembering the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and what he's done for you. And that it's the only answer for our world's problem. Next week, we get to the most famous I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So the gospel ought to motivate us in our walk with him to be more like Christ, to worship him, to desire him, to want more of him. But it should also be the thing that helps us to understand we live in a hopeless world and the answer is Jesus Christ. 
And so if you're here this morning, I, I said at the beginning of this list that we've gone through, you don't do these things to get God's favor. We do these things because the favor of God has been poured out on us. And if you've never trusted Christ, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't make any sense to me. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm not sure I want to do all those things. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you understand what Christ has done and who he is, these other things, like, of course I want to do that. Of course I want to be a person of the word. Of course I want to be a person of prayer. Of course I want to be a person who's living in purity. Of course, of course, of course. Why? Because of who Jesus is and what he's done. If you've never trusted Christ, today's day, believe. Believe and be saved. Here's the last one. Stand in worship. Stand in worship. Now, I could have put this one first because it's the motivation for all of the rest of them. And that's why I put it at the end. So we can come back and look at that list and go, because we're people of God who stand in worship. We're going to stand in worship. Psalm 96, 9 says, Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. When we have a right view of God, we have a right view of who he is and what he deserves in our lives, the rest of it just all makes sense to us. We're going to do a series this summer, five weeks, Lord willing, on the topic of worship. And I'm working out how that we'll pull that apart and look at You could spend the rest of our lives talking about this, right? And we're going to try and cover a big chunk of it in five weeks this summer. Why? Because this is so important. The reason, you ready? The reason that you don't get to church on time on Sunday morning is because you have a wrong view of God. Oh, pastor, you just crossed the line. You don't know what happened in our house this morning. Yeah, I got grace for a week. I don't have grace for eight weeks of coming in on the third song. You're like, oh, you have a wrong view of God. Whatever it was that keeps you from getting here on time was more important to you than your worship. I have to be here on time, so that one's kind of easy for me to talk about, right? Right? I get it, you have four kids, you're trying to get them into the van or whatever it is, and one of them throws up, and okay, I get it. Sunday morning for lots of people is like the worst morning of the, of, because Satan doesn't want you here on time. He doesn't want you to come to church with joy in your heart. He doesn't want any of those things. And it's not the only thing, it's just a simple little picture. We want to talk about worship personally and in family and corporately and you know during our service here's an illustration of it for you during our service there was a verse up on the screen that said be still and know that I am God what did you do with that verse no, really was it like well, it's up on the verse that's nice I've read that before thanks for reminding me of the verse or did you be still and think about God and who he is and what he's done for you. Are you a passive worshiper? Are you an active worshiper? Stand in worship. Well, so what? So what? And at this point, I got one point for you here. Keep growing in your sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Someone once said, if the word or the work of God has not changed you, it probably has not saved you. We need to be people of God who are growing in our sanctification. I'm not what I used to be. I'm not what I will be. I'm not even what I should be, but I'm not what I was. As you think about the spiritual disciplines in your life, is that true for you? I'm not what I used to be. I'm not what I will be. I'm not even yet what I should be, but I'm not what I was. Why? Because I'm growing in my walk with Christ. I'm spending some time in the Word. 
I'm spending some time in prayer. I'm accountable to other people. I love the church of Jesus Christ. I want to be a person of purity. I want to be a person who worships the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. So I got on the bathroom scale this morning, and let me tell you, the armor of God is heavy. You're not going to do this perfectly. But are we people who are growing up into the image of Jesus Christ, our Lord? The standing, the standing, the spiritual disciplines, they're too much. They're too much for me. And they are. But they're not too much for what the Lord can do. And there's not too much for what we can do together as we spur one another on to love and good deeds. What is it God's called you today out of this message? This I will do because I want to know my Savior more. I want to worship my God for his glory more and more until he comes. Let's pray. Father, in some ways this is a heavy message. It's heavy for me. It's good to me for me to remember. I haven't arrived. I'm arriving. I haven't got it all figured out. I'm figuring it out. But Lord, I'm doing it with the help of your word. I'm doing it in prayer. I'm doing it with the body of Christ. I'm doing it with a desire to be more like him. Lord, would that be the message that people hear in us today? That we would put on the armor of God, that the fruit of the spirit would be who we are, that we would be people who stand, standing for your glory because we worship our Savior who gave his 